disappointment, frustration and anger. Common sentiments on the Palestinian street. But not only are they fed up with Israel, they're fed up with their own leaders too. Many say the Palestinian Authority is corrupt, oppressive and has yet to deliver an end to occupation. So how much is the Palestinian leadership to blame for the woes of its people? I'm Mehdi Hassan and I've come here to the Oxford Union to go head to head with Dr. Saab Erekat, the chief Palestinian negotiator and influential advisor to Presidents Arafat and Abbas. But today I'm going to challenge him on his strategy, his failure to achieve peace and whether the Palestinians need new leaders. Tonight, I'll also be joined by Professor Rosemary Hollis, a leading expert on the Israel-Palestine conflict and director of the Olive Tree program. Sharif Nashashibi, an award-winning Palestinian journalist and Middle East analyst, and Dr. Manuel Hassassian, the Palestinian ambassador to the UK. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest tonight, Dr. Saeb Arakat. Good evening. Good evening to you. Saeb, you were a Palestinian negotiator at Madrid in 1991, at Camp David in 2000, at Annapolis in 2007. Let's begin by dealing with this question, what did all those negotiations actually achieve? Given the occupation is still going on, stronger than ever before, surely they were a complete and utter waste of time? No, I disagree with you. I think uh, I was 12 years old when the occupation came to my hometown, Jericho. Palestine was cancelled off the map as back as 1948. And I think today when we introduce something about the state of Palestine in the UN, 165 nation states stand tall to vote for us. Mahdi, I was born as a Palestinian and I'm proud of it for one reason, to put my country with East Jerusalem's capital back to the map. But what did those negotiations, 20 odd years of Oslo peace process negotiations, what did they actually achieve on the ground? How did they visibly improve the lives of an ordinary Palestinian family in Jericho or Nablus or Ramallah or Gaza City? Well, the purpose of the negotiations is to have the people of Jericho, Nablus, East Jerusalem, Gaza, Ramallah live like you live in Britain, live normally, to get rid of this ugly occupation, to end this apartheid regime. I'm trying my best to save lives of Israelis and Palestinians. I'm trying my best to deliver a two-state solution. And my question is, is your best working? Because the occupation seems more entrenched than it was in 1993. Over the last 20 years, 7,000 Palestinians have been killed, 12,000 Palestinian homes demolished, and extra 250,000 Israeli settlers in the West Bank. Israel has been able to carry that out, the argument that's they, put forward, Israel, because you, the Palestinians, gave them cover. You came to the table, you allowed, you bought them time, they carried on expanding and building settlements, they and would, you gave them cover. They, I, I can't give them cover. I'm under their occupation. And since Eve negotiated, Adam, I'm the most disadvantaged negotiator in the history of mankind. I have no army, no navy, no air force. My people are fragmented. I'm alone. But the point of the matter, don't blame those who are trying to make peace. Don't blame the negotiations because negotiation is not an end. It's the, it's the, it's the means to achieve the end. Blame these Israeli governments and blame these Western governments who still insist on treating Israel as a country above the laws of man. I would share that analysis, but you are the one who chooses to engage in these one-sided negotiations. Why do You're I the one who doesn't walk away from the table. Why, why, do I the choose, why do I choose to negotiate? If I negotiate with a guy for 20 years, and for 20 years I'm banging my head on a brick wall, I might say, some say, this is pointless. Negotiations is a civilized instrument people use in conflict. And when the matrix of interest between conflicting parties mature to the point where the price of peace is much cheaper than the price of war. We'll have peace. Okay. Well, on the, you mentioned civilized instrument. Just to be clear, because there are negotiations ongoing, have you completely given up the right to armed resistance against this military occupation that you describe, which some would say is a right claimed under international law, which is a right claimed by resistance groups throughout history? I'm just wondering where you stand on violence. Me, Does the I Palestinian movement under the look, leadership look, of under, President under, Abbas recognize a right to resist? There is no single house in Palestine, including my household, that we didn't lose a loved one, 
that don't have a loved one in prison. As long as there is occupation, there'll be resistance. That's so the Palestinians right. do have the right? Absolutely we have the right. Absolutely we have the right. Okay. Now, if we want to pursue peace to save lives of Israelis and Palestinians, is that wrong? A lot of Palestinians who I speak to, I was in the West Bank a couple of years ago, they say we're an occupied people. By negotiating with the occupier, you're giving the impression to the world that this is, a, this is a split between two equal parties rather than one occupier, as you say, and one occupied people. You're helping the Israeli narrative. No, I don't, I don't think so. I'm not saying life is about fairness and justice. As I told you from the beginning when I entered here, Mahdi, I was born as a Palestinian. I'm proud of being a Palestinian for yeah. one reason, to bring my country with East Jerusalem's capital back to the map. In your two decades as a top Palestinian negotiator, I, correct me if I'm wrong, you've resigned from your post four times, eight. most recently in October. Eight, eight. Eight times. I believe you've threatened resignation several times. So my question is, what credibility do you have as a negotiator if you keep resigning and then keep coming back to the table? How can people take you seriously? The last time I resigned was in protest of Mr. Netanyahu. Since we began negotiations, he added 10,558 housing settlement units. That's four times the natural growth of New York. He killed 36 Palestinians in court Which blood. Which is fine, so, he, so resign, but why he, go back again? He, he, he demolished 219 homes, and, and then I submit my resignation to my president, yeah. all right? And then my resignation is still standing, by the way, but I don't leave my office before some replacement, and I hope they find a replacement. So you're willing to stand aside tomorrow? I'm, no, not tomorrow, yesterday. <laughs> Right now, you are the chief Palestinian negotiator That's with fine. your resignation letter un unopened. What are the current round of peace talks that the world is watching, led by US Secretary of State John Kerry? What do you hope they will achieve? How will they be different to all of the failed peace talks and summits and conferences that have come and gone before? No one benefits more from John Kerry's success than Palestinians, and no one loses more from John Kerry's failure than Palestinians. Yep. That's the truth. So we're exerting every possible effort in order to ensure the success of John Kerry. This man, I've known, I've, I've known John for 26 years, all right? And he knows what makes me tick. Do you believe he's an honest broker in this? Yes. John Kerry is a man, Saeb, who once said, I will never compromise America's special relationship with Israel. I will never pressure Israel to make concessions that will compromise its securities. He called Yasser Arafat, your former boss, an impediment to the peace process, an outlaw to the peace process. Mm -hmm. He doesn't sound very neutral to me. I don't think he's a member of the PLO, John Kerry. You asked a question about an American Secretary of State being fair or not. I'm telling you, this time... So he's changed? You I, think he's changed? No, no I, he's telling the world. He, I entered negotiations with him on the basis of a letter given to me on July 29th in his office in Washington, saying that the basis of these negotiations, two states on the 1967 lines, all core issues, Jerusalem border settlement, refugees, will be negotiated without exceptions, no interim solutions, no interim agreements, and that's what he said. So and how much time are you giving him? He has till uh, April 29th and we will not extend the negotiations for one minute. Quite a few Palestinians are worried that you're going to give up the right of return, as it's known, uh, as enshrined in international law. The so-called Palestine Papers, the leaked collection of confidential documents about the peace process in 2011, suggested you and Mahmoud Abbas had signed up to Israel accepting only around 10,000 Palestinian refugees over 10 years out of a total Palestinian refugee population estimated at somewhere around 5 million. I told Almort, no refugee delegated me or mandated me to negotiate on his behalf. Number one, this refugee did not become a refugee because of a tsunami or volcano or an earthquake. This became as a result of the creation of Israel. Israel should bear the moral and legal responsibility. Secondly, you set an international mechanism, and this international mechanism go to every single refugee and ask them the choices. So you the 10,000, just to no, get about the no, 10,000 is a made up number. No, no, the 10,000, hear me, please, employ your hearing skills, Mahdi. You employ your speaking skills okay, and then we'll get an answer. I'm, I'm trying my best to tell you that the answer I gave him, no refugee mandated me. This is the free choice of every single refugee. Number one, the right to return to Palestine with compensation, return to Israel with compensation, remaining where he is with compensation. And this is how you end claims. Because if I were an Israeli negotiator, Mahdi, I'll demand two things from Palestinians. End of conflict, end of claims. How can I end claims without this refugee practicing his choice. Let's stick with the current Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, in his office. He has said that there can be no peace deal, John Kerry or otherwise, unless the Palestinians sign up to recognizing Israel as a Jewish state. Are you willing to do that as part of these peace I talks? will never recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Why not? Because I have recognized the state of Israel right to exist in exchange of mutual recognition 1993. 
and nations registered with their name at the UN, the name of Israel, the state of Israel. Now, you know why they want me to recognize this Jewish state? I am the son of the Natofians who built my hometown Jericho 10,000 years ago. I'm the son of the Arab Canaanites who were there 6,000 years before Yeshua ben Nun came and built my hometown Jericho. What the Israelis want me to do when I recognize Israel as a Jewish state, they want me to change my narrative, my history, my religion. And you won't do it? I will not do it. But if your friend John Kerry says you have to do it as part of this deal? No force on earth will change, will make me change my so narrative. Is it, and are you, saying that as, are you saying that as Saeb Erika? Or saying, are you saying that as the chief I'm Palestinian saying, negotiator? I'm saying that on behalf of 11 million Palestinians. Okay. So I'm, is it, I'm, so I'm me, their chief negotiator. So let me deploy my speaking skills yes. and ask you a very clear question, Go and ahead. you can answer it very clearly for yes. everyone here. Is it a deal breaker? If the deal is that you have to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, you will say no, see you later. Bring on April 29th. Number one, you're right. I cannot accept Israel as a Jewish state. Number two, I cannot accept any document without East Jerusalem being the capital of Palestine. It's meaningless for Palestine to emerge as a state without East Jerusalem being a capital of Palestine. And what I mean by East Jerusalem is the holy Aqsa Mosque and the holy sepulcher and the old city and the six square kilometers that existed in 1967. I cannot accept any formula for refugees other than the free choice of every single refugee making the choice. I want to end conflict. I want to end claims. And then you said, 20 years Palestinians have been negotiating, Israelis doing settlements and so on. Had we accepted what you're trying to promote, what, what uh, people are saying about us, why would Arafat have been sieged and killed under siege? Why are they to calling us non-partners? Why, why this smear campaign? Yes, I believe note. Yasser Arafat was killed. Oh, you're How, you're saving me questions as well, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So you believe, Yasser Arafat, my, you believe Yasser Arafat was killed by Israel? To be honest with you, Yasser Arafat was sieged by Israel. The Prime Minister of Israel, Sharon, said we must get rid of Arafat. The Defense Minister of Israel, Mufaz, said we must get rid of Arafat. A person in my position should not jump to conclusions before, without evidence. I don't have evidence. But my heart knows that, that Yasser Arafat was sieged and killed by Israel. So your heart says, Israelis killed my president. Your head says, I'm going to negotiate with them in good faith. I'm going to negotiate with them in good faith because I want to save the lives of my children and grandchildren. Do you worry about your own life then? I think we are all in danger. Abu Mazen is in danger. He's being threatened today. There are ministers in the Israeli cabinet who are saying we must get rid of Abu Mazen. Abu Mazen, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, for those of our viewers who aren't familiar with the other name, he's in the tenth year of a four-year presidential term. Yes. His yes. presidency expired in 2009. Yes. No, they didn't, they didn't expire. The term came to an end. No. You, uh, technically speaking, you may argue no, this. Actually speaking. But, but in, <coughs> in our basic law, it says the president will be elected for four years and he will continue to be the president till he shakes hand with the new elected president. Who is right? himself. We, Abu Mazen, wanted elections to happen, and believe me, he is the one who is not glued to a seat. Uh, Sharif Nashashibi is a Palestinian journalist based here in the UK. He's also uh, an analyst of Arab and media affairs. You've been listening to Saeb Erekat speak about the past 20 years and the current negotiations. He says there's no alternative. People are unfairly criticizing him. What's your take on this? Well, it's interesting. He brings up holding Israel to account and international mechanisms. Almost a year and a half ago, we upgraded our status at the UN. This allowed us um, entry into the International Criminal Court. We could take Israel to court. Since then, you and the PA have been threatening to do that, and you haven't. How many more settlers do we need to accept? How many houses need to be demolished? How many people need to be killed before we say, enough? We have a weapon in our hands that we're not using. It's a potent weapon, and international law is on our side. Why have we not joined the ICC? Why are we not taking Israel to court? This is the alternative we should be pursuing. I think you're absolutely right. A mistake was made by us. And I personally take the responsibility for delaying this accession nine months. I made the deal personally with John Kerry that if Netanyahu gives me the 104 prisoners before Oslo, we will refrain from going to these agencies for nine months. I made the deal. I know it's a heavy price. These 104 prisoners deserve this price. Okay, well, let's also hear, let's also hear from Professor Rosemary Hollis from City University, teaches international politics, one of the leading experts on the Middle East conflict in the UK. Why are, you, are these talks not also focusing on the issues in legal terms? I have 22 lawyers in my team. They're Palestinians from all over Earth, <clears throat> from Chile, from Argentina, from London, from Paris, from Harvard, from... Italy from uh, Canada, the top of the top. Palestinians who left 
their offices in New York, in Harvard, in London, and came and they're living in Ramallah, paying their own rents to serve their country. Okay, can I bring in, also on our panel tonight, uh, is Professor Manuel Hassassian, who is the Palestinian ambassador to the United Kingdom. Uh, I want to ask you this. Saleb says the US and the UK governments can be seen as, he says John Kerry is an impartial broker. You work as an envoy for your people abroad. Do you first, really see Western governments as impartial brokers in this conflict? First of all, let me challenge the line of questioning here. Please because, please. you know, you have been attacking the strategy of the Palestinians of negotiations. <clears throat> We have realized in 1988, in our 19th PNC, that armed struggle is not going to achieve the Palestinian independence set because we were portrayed in the international community by the Zionist propaganda machine that we are terrorists. We are not terrorists, we said, we will politically accommodate through negotiations and practice our universal right for self-determination. We have seen along the practices that the top dog has been unequivocally supported by what is so-called the third party. But we haven't seen the European Union playing an imperative role in creating that balance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Back in November 2009, yes. you told reporters yes. that the time may have come for President Abbas to, quote, tell his people the truth, that with the continuation of settlement activities, the two-state solution is no longer an option. Those are your words from 2009. There have since been tens of thousands of Israeli settlers added to the West Bank since you made that statement. So why do you continue to push for a two-state solution, which you yourself four years ago said, time's up? I agree, I agree with you, and I told, actually, my you last... You agree with yourself, you mean, because I'm yeah. quoting your words. No, no, yeah. <laughs> I agree with the, your line of questioning yeah. now, because I said that. Yes. And actually... <laughs> you did. My, my last resignation was because I asked Abu Mazen on November 5th to sign on the accession, and he refused. And I told him the following. As much as we put a strategy, Netanyahu puts a strategy. Netanyahu's strategy is three falls. Number one, he wants a Palestinian authority without an authority. Number two, he wants a cost-free occupation. Number three, he wants to keep Gaza off the Palestinian space. Which means that Netanyahu is working towards one state, two systems, not a two-state solution. There is no such a thing as a one-state solution. There is a one-state reality. But Israel has three options. Option number one, my option, two states, 1967. Number two, if they want to call my hometown Jericho Yericho and refer to me as Mar Erekat in Hebrew, Mr., talk to me about it. And once I say this, they will tell me, you evil Palestinians, you want to undermine the Jewish nature of Israel. So you don't want two states, you don't want one state. And what's, what's developing on the ground is the third Israel's option, which is an apartheid. And no one in the world has the stomach for such an apartheid. Today, in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, there are roads I cannot use as a Christian and a Muslim Palestinian. Only Jews and Israelis can use. There is a worse apartheid system today in the West Bank and East Jerusalem than that which existed in South Africa. My option is to live and let live. I really want two-state solution. And if it doesn't happen, what if is your plan B? If it doesn't, if this my, negotiations my, my, fail on April the 29th, my, what my are you going to do? My plan B, Abu Mazen will sign the 63 letters of accession, including Rome stature. And I told the Israelis, if you worry about international criminal courts stop committing crimes. There are Jewish kids today, ladies and gentlemen. They come from London, from Paris, from New York, and they come to the West Bank and East Jerusalem. They burn trees, they burn homes, they burn mosques, and they believe when they're doing this, they're closer to God. This is very, very wrong to any society. And these are war crimes. So that's that, your, that was going to be your pursuit post April 29th? Exactly. And then when, once we do this, I'm, I'm afraid the authority will collapse. The Palestinian authority, the one you know, cannot be sustained in its current form because Bibi Netanyahu change, is changing the role of the PA. The PA was born to transfer Palestinians from occupation to independence. That's the task. Now Bibi Netanyahu wants this authority to pay salaries and to do security and so on. It's not sustainable anymore. And then if you want me to take you into the scenarios of after that, it's going to be very ugly. And mark my words, what's happening in the Arab world is Arab are democratizing. And anyone who says Arabs are not ready for democracy is a racist. And this is the best thing that happened to me as a Palestinian. All right? It's going to be painful. It's going to be long. It's going to be bloody. We need two things to defeat extremism in this region. One, democracy in the Arab world. Secondly, drying the swamp of the Israeli occupation. Okay. You know, I have six grandchildren. The youngest is three months old, and the oldest is five years old. I've done everything humanly possible to avoid the road I went through for them. And the sad, the sad thing that aches my heart 
is I really don't want my children to be suicide bombers. Is this is too much to do a job for it? You say that you don't want them to be suicide bombers. But there are lots of other ways of resisting, non-violent resistance. One form is the boycott movement, the boycott, divestment, sanctions, the BDS campaign against Israel. You've referred tonight several times to Israel being worse than apartheid. And yet, in apartheid South Africa, the ANC, the National Liberation Movement there, Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, they supported the international boycott movement against South Africa. You say Israel's worse than South Africa, and yet you and Mahmoud Abbas say, don't boycott Israel, we don't support the BDS movement. How do you explain that contradiction? We are with every single legal move any nation wants to take. What about non-nation groups? Non -nation People's movements? Pe people, individuals, nations, groups. In South Africa, Mahmoud Anyone. Abbas said we do not support a Mahmoud, boycott Mahmoud, against Mahmoud, Israel. President Mahmoud Abbas said the following. I'm not asking people to boycott the Israeli universities or so on because I'm engaged with them for this nine months. Rosemary Hollis, we've been talking about one state, two states. Given where we are now, do you still think a two-state solution is viable, possible? It's very difficult to see how it would work uh, in such a manner that all the Palestinians, including all the refugees, could agree to it. Uh, I think we're asking you, Dr. Erekat, could the Palestinians not improve their go in negotiating stance? Usually when we do in our negotiating behavior, usually we, we put positions what we want. This time we chose another negotiating behavior. December 8, 2013, a letter from President Mahmoud Abbas to President Obama, I'm revealing it now. <coughs> Janu January 4th, 2014, a letter from President Abbas to John Kerry. We said in this letter, Abu Mazen said, what, not what we want, not what we can, what we cannot do. This is it. It's a moment of truth. Believe me, negotiations are over. We don't need negotiations. It's time for decisions now. So today, it's all up to John Kerry and President Obama. Okay. Sharif, you're Palestinian. Would you rather live in a, this whole debate about one state, two states, would you rather live in a single binational secular state or would you rather live in a Palestinian state next to an Israeli state? I mean, the debate has moved on long ago. Not, it used to be about whether one would prefer one state or two states. Now the, the reality is whether two states is possible, not preferable. Do you believe it's possible? No. We passed that years ago. It's not possible. The occupation and colonization of Palestine is so entrenched I don't see how that can be reversed. I mean, if you look at, at the withdrawal from Gaza, there was national uproar in Israel over the withdrawal of several thousand uh, settlers. We're talking about several hundred thousand settlers in the West Bank. Okay, well, how, let me, put that, let let me put that point to Ambassador Hassassin. It's just not possible to bring about two states, which you're negotiating for. The only feasible solution is a two-state solution. And the dismantling of settlement is not that a big deal because in second track negotiations with the Israelis, we have managed to come up with many solutions. The question okay. of equality in terms of transfer of land and what have you is manageable, my dear friend. Okay, well, we're going to take a break there. Uh, we've been talking about the peace process and negotiations uh, with Saab Erekat. In part two, we're going to talk about uh, what's going on in the occupied territories with the Palestinian Authority. Uh, accusations of corruption and human rights abuses have been made. We're and we're also... Stuff. We're also going to hear more from our, our very loquacious guest and from our very patient audience here in the Oxford Union. Join us for part two of Head to Head. Welcome back. You're watching Head to Head on Al Jazeera. We're here in the Oxford Union with Dr. Saeb Erekat, the chief Palestinian negotiator. We've been talking about the peace process, about negotiations with John Kerry, about two states versus one state. I was in the West Bank in 2012, and I found a lot of Palestinians, a lot of young Palestinians, who were angry and frustrated, not just with the Israelis and the occupation and with Western governments, but also with the Palestinian Authority, with Palestinian security forces, over human rights abuses, over a lack of democracy, lack of transparency, corruption allegations. You must hear the same thing when you're traveling through Jericho or Nablus or Ramallah. Well, actually, I have almost three demonstrations against me personally every week. Okay. So I hear <laughs> much more than this. Look, uh, there were those Palestinians who tried to abuse their offices to gain things they should not, corruption. But I think we are the first Arab society in the last 1,000 years that in the year 2012, 2013, three ministers appeared in front of the corruption court and they were sentenced. I'm not saying we don't commit mistakes. I'm not saying that there are not those who are trying to abuse their offices. I'm not saying there are not human rights violations. 
I'm not saying there are not mistakes we're committing, mm. but with these mistakes happening, we are doing everything humanly possible to try not to repeat these mistakes, to learn from them. You say that, but last year, the polling in the West Bank showed four out of five West Bankers uh -huh. believed the Abbas administration, the Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, Palestinian Authority government was corrupt. People have a court in Ramallah called the Corruption Court. If anybody has a case against anyone, they can carry this case and file with the evidence and go to the court. And they can submit something against President Mahmoud Abbas personally, if they wish to, against Saab Arakat, against anyone. That's their given right. You say you can submit things against President Abbas personally. Yes, they can. Uh, a leading Palestinian businessman, Mohammed al Sabawi, just recently was arrested by security forces held for nine hours in a prison cell merely for calling on President Abbas to resign. That sounds almost like a police state and to me. It's, it's the mistake what happened with this Sabawi and Abu Mazen personally interfered to release him. What about the other people who have been detained uh, without there charge? Were, there were hundreds and hundreds of cases no, no, over there the years. There were 63 cases. 63? That Middle East uh, International and Human Rights Watch have submitted to us. And believe me, we have followed it case by case. The Independent Commission for Human Rights says 685 arbitrary arrests in the West Bank in 2012 alone. Well, there, were, there are arrests. We have, you know, we, just as I told you, we have normal uh, people who can commit crimes, can be but this. It's not, but it's not look, normal. Look, it's not look, normal. Look, this look, is look. arbitrary arrest, I, detention without trial, wait a minute, wait a minute, torture, wait a minute, sleep wait a deprivation, beatings, no shootings, one, if someone amnesty and human rights, which have all documented this. Oh, look. We have jails, we have people who have been arrested. We're not a country. We have so many restrictions, so many limitations. We have an overloaded wagon. We people. have no an overloaded wagon of complexities. I am personally dealing with Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. You mentioned Amnesty. Sanjeev Berry, who works for Amnesty International in the United States, he says when Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian territories engage in peaceful protest, they can face brutal crackdowns from Palestinian security forces. It is time for the US to stop looking the other way while Palestinian protesters are beaten and shot. I think beating demonstrators is a mistake. Yes, more than a mistake. I'm admitting it. When you, when you torture I'm people, it's I'm more admitting than a mistake. It. It's shameful. Okay, well, on the issue of shamefulness, when I was in Ramallah, uh, I drove past a building which I was told was the Palestinian presidential palace cost several million dollars, it was grossly, obscenely big. I'm wondering, why does the president of an occupied people need to live in a palace? It's not built for him, it's for our guests. <laughs> Which guests? We have foreign dignitaries that come to visit Palestine. So you think it's justified day. spending several million no, no, dollars no, no, on look, a Abumazin, presidential palace? Look, Mahmoud Abbas lives in, a, in an apartment in Ramallah. I, Saab Ariqat, live in the home I was born in, in Jericho. All right? And what you call the presidential palace is a guest house. We have parliamentarians from all over Earth. We have NGOs coming to visit us and so on. So where, where are you going to keep putting them? In the moving big at $300 a night, we can't afford it. This is why we built this guest house. And please come and visit it. And if you come, I will have you stay there. We did. <laughs> I did come to Ramallah, and when the Al Jazeera camera crew went to film the palace, they were threatened with arrest. <laughs> you talked about in part one the Palestine papers, which you urged everyone to go and look at please, online please, on, the, the of Al on the Al Jazeera Read website. An advert from the guest tonight. Well, one of the documents on there is a uh, conversation between you and David Hale, the US Middle East envoy, deputy envoy, in September 2009, and you're quoted as saying, we have had to kill Palestinians to establish one authority, one gun, and the rule of law. We continue to perform our obligations. We have invested time and effort and killed our own people to maintain order and the rule of law. It's true. That's true. There were Palestinians who were killed in clashes because we said if we want to build a nation state, we must have one authority, one gun, and the rule of law. In the UK, okay, if a group of people will claim that they want to do something, and taken to arms, what, what happens? What happens in any country on earth? Look, the worst thing that can happen to a society is multiple authorities. As the United States, 100 years after independence, when there were multiple authorities, there were half a million Americans who were killed. Ask Algeria two, two decades Some... ago. Ask Afghanistan what's going on now when people take to arms. Ask India. When nation states get the disease of multiple authorities, some you have disasters, you and we will not tolerate this. You say that's the worst look, thing that look. could happen. Some Palestinians say the worst thing that could happen is that the Palestinian Authority and the PLO were set up to stand up to the Israelis and protect the Palestinians, but instead what we've seen is 
protecting the Israelis and standing up to the Palestinians. Sharif Nashashibi, you're a Palestinian journalist based in the UK. What do you think of the Palestinian Authority's uh, security record, human rights record and the rest? I, uh, I joined, several years ago, I joined a UN program that sends expatriate Palestinians to Palestine to help build institutions there. And uh, they placed me in the Palestinian Authority as a media consultant. And uh, I experienced firsthand corruption, nepotism and ineptitude. And I went to Palestine really wanting to make a difference to my country and I left completely despondent that the PA had the ability or even the willingness to make a real difference on the ground. And I spoke to many other UN employees, Palestinians who are in the same program, who are in the Palestinian Authority, who felt exactly the same way. Sharif, it's your country. I mean, you're there. As much as I have a duty to do for my country and to get it back, you have a country to do it. So you have no excuse to leave. It's you and me and Manuel and every single Palestinian who believes in bringing Palestine back to the map. We should stay the course and fight, stand sh I shoulder to shoulder. Palestine but please, here because but, I'm not sidelined. But please, here. I was side Ashraf, in my own Sharif, country. Let me bring in Ambassador Hassassian, who's here. You're an envoy for your people abroad. Yes. Do you find it difficult to make the case for your people in London or Washington or Paris with all these allegations of human rights abuses and corruption being thrown at you and at the Palestinian Authority? First of all, I represent the entire Palestinian people. So when I speak about Palestine, I speak about every single Palestinian. So from that perspective, let me tell you something. First of all, you are still in the middle of a national liberation movement. The objective conditions that we are living in under occupation, I think your question should be directed towards the human rights abuse and violations of an occupier for almost five million Palestinians. There, where we have to concert our efforts in finding our battles. With respect, now we, beg, we, beg, we have Israeli guests on the show, we, we put beg, those abuses to them. We now we have Palestinian differ. guests on the show, I'm putting them to you. Yes, we beg to differ sometimes amongst ourselves, but this is the beauty of pluralism and democracy. Now, nobody says every government is perfect, every country is perfect. There are human rights abuses in the United States, in the UK, in Europe. So we cannot just come and say that the PA is practicing human rights abuses against its people. That's not true. It's looking at the glass as being half empty and not as half full. We have achieved so much as authority to the Palestinian people. If you've been tortured with respect, I'm not sure you would care about whether the glass is half empty or half full. Let me bring in Professor Rosemary Hollis, who's an academic at City University here in London, one of Britain's leading experts uh, on the Middle East and this conflict. Uh, Rosemary, same question to you. How much damage do you think these allegations of human rights abuses and corruption have done to the Palestinian cause in the international arena? Uh, not a lot, actually. Uh, I think the days when they did the Palestinians the most damage was in the 1990s, uh, when the Palestinians were constantly expected to change and be better in order to meet Israeli requirements for a partner in the negotiating process. Now, there are two things that you... Yep. Please. In whatever order you like. First of all, <clears throat> I'm not going to justify a single Palestinian being tortured. That's wrong. That should stop. And I can assure you that the president of Palestine, Mahmoud Abbas, is personally involved in every single case. I'm not saying that, we, that it stopped. But I, did not, I don't think any of us should, should justify these things. And I don't think any Palestinian should, ju should, should justify any form of corruption. I don't think so. Mistakes are being committed. And we, Sharif, myself, and all those Palestinians who want to build a nation must stand shoulder to shoulder in order to, sure, to make sure that the right people are in office in Palestine. And we will make it. Okay, well, on that note, let's bring in our very patient audience here in the Oxford Union. Uh, we've been talking about the peace process, negotiations, the United States, one state versus two states, human rights abuses, lots of subjects. Stick your hands up in the air. Uh, let's go to the lady here in the front to begin with. Is there any good news in Kerry's evident determination? And do you carry any faith in a framework agreement that could be established to provide meaningful parameters for negotiations on a final deal? To be honest with you, I don't know. I, I'm doing my best. I did my best with John Kerry. I submitted everything. I did everything humanly possible to make him succeed. We offered so many things up till today. John Kerry did not present any official position to us. So I don't know whether he wants to do framework for negotiations or a framework agreement for permanent status. These are two different things, by the way. Okay. If he goes the path of framework for negotiations, that means he may be introducing new terms of reference for the negotiations, which is something going to be bad. 
Okay. If good. he wants to introduce framework agreement on permanent status issues with no interim solutions, nothing else, we will study it. Okay, let's go back but to... But he needs to put it on the table. He hasn't done it yet. Okay, gentleman here in the maroon shirt. Um, you mentioned in that one of the things we need uh, is democracy in the Arab world. So do you think that we have democracy in Palestine? Are you Palestinian yourself? Yes. And do you believe there's a democratic system in no. place? Look, Hamas is a Palestinian political party. They won the elections. I remember the day that uh, Mr. Haniya came to submit his government for the Legislative Council. I had won the seat in Jericho and the Jordan Valley for Fatah, and I was nominated to give the speech in the loyal opposition. I told him, Mr. Haniya, today you are not the Prime Minister of Hamas. You are my Prime Minister. You are the Prime Minister of the Palestinian people. When Imam Khomeini came to office in Iran, he changed the name of his country, but he committed to all Iran's obligations. So did Nelson Mandela, who so does everybody. Please separate between your role as Hamas and as Prime Minister for Palestine. Now we're asking them for reconciliation. What do we want to do? We want to have elections. Number one elections is for the Palestine National Council. Wherever Palestinians can vote, they should vote. The 11 million. And that's the key to reconciliation. That's the Doha Agreement. The Doha Agreement... Do you think there will be reconciliation with Hamas? I'm sure there will. Even though they don't support your current negotiations? They don't have to. They don't have to. I, I sit with Mash'al. And by the way, he's an honest, decent man. I report to him. I report to all my, my leaders in Palestine. This is my obligation. They need to disagree with me, criticize me, and so on. But yes, we need but to have elections... a few years ago, you were all killing for each other the PNC, For the PNC. Look, when we differ... Mahdi, we should resort to ballots and not bullets. Hamas made the strategic mistake of resorting to bullets. Okay, let's take a, let's take a question from the gentleman there with a the hand up. Yep. Could you explain to us how the continued arrest and detention and harassment of Hamas members in the West Bank advances the cause of national reconciliation? Look, we have a problem. We have a serious problem in this split. And People are not arrested because they are Hamas. Palestinians are being arrested in the West Bank simply because they either smuggle guns or launder money or so on. But we don't go and arrest Hamas because they are Hamas. As a matter of fact, we want to have reconciliation with Hamas. Hamas is a Palestinian party like Fatah. And Fatah and Hamas were established to put Palestine back to the map. Palestine and Jerusalem is much more important than Fatah and Hamas. That is the truth, and we need Hamas. Okay, let's go, gentleman here in the white shirt, second row. Thank you, uh, Dr. Erekut. I, I think you're right to give negotiations and the two-state solution a, a last chance with Kerry. The alternatives to that are worse. My question to you is: the criticism is that the Palestinians have never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. If this is the last opportunity, can you come forward this time for a proposal? How can you ensure? that if this is the last chance for the two-state solution, that we get it in this process. We are exerting every possible effort in order to ensure Kerry's success. We want him to succeed. We want the two-state solution. But if the Israeli government, and Mr. Netanyahu insists on dictation, on, on fait accompli policies, on settlements, and so on, he's destroying the two-state solution. And you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm not a racist. Okay. I'm, I'm not against Jews. I'm not against Christians, Muslims being equal votes one state, but once I say this, you know, many Israelis get angry. They think that we don't want a two-state solution. So if I offer you recognition, and I'm yet to hear a single Israeli official from this government to tell me that they recognize the state of Palestine, right to exist in peace and security in 67. I'm waiting to hear an Israeli official saying East Jerusalem okay. is the capital of Palestine. Okay, gentlemen here. I'm waiting row. for an Israeli okay. to stand up and apologize for refugees. Okay, let's take another question from the audience. Gentlemen in the front row, wait for the mic to come for you in the jumper. Dr. Arakat, we Palestinians are justice and peace seekers. And despite the fact that Palestinian leadership, led by President Mahmoud Abbas, has been very flexible and agreed to, to, to resume the talks with Israeli in spite of continuing settlement, expansion policy. And re but recently, Israeli officials say we have no peace partner. Is that because the Palestinian leadership mm -hmm refuse to concede the, the, the Palestinian national rights? If Mother Teresa were to become the president of Palestinians, Montesquieu to become the speaker of the Palestinian parliament, and Thomas Jefferson to become the prime minister of Palestine, the three of them, imagine, one cabinet, and they were to say a Palestinian state in 67 
East Jerusalem is its capital, right of refugees in accordance with 194. Israeli officials will say, these are non-partners. We don't have a partner. They are related to bin Laden. <laughs> so that's the truth. Okay, right? let's, on that note, let's take some more questions. <laughs> gentleman, gentleman with the beard and the glasses, on the third row. Uh, Dr. Rakat, I'm looking at that through Israeli eyes, and I ask myself, why should we stop? We can continue pushing you. We can continue building settlements. You won't do anything. We can retain the army in the Jordan Valley. You won't do anything. Will the PLO continue choosing survival over strategy, or are we going to see something you haven't seen before on April 29th? Thank you. The PLO stands for bringing Palestine back to the map with this Jerusalem's capital. Today, you, say, you tell me, what, what did I gain? Today, 165 nations in the last resolutions of the UN voted for me. Now we have the power to, uh, to make accession to 63 organizations, and once again, we have every single while right. While you're signing signatures, settlement growth continues, as you Fine, yourself but this, say. But these are war crimes. But you're not stopping them. They will stop, and we will stop them. OK, let's take another. I want a lady from the audience, please. Lady in the third row. Uh, I'm a Palestinian myself, and I want to ask you a very personal question. As a Palestinian who experienced the Israeli soldiers uh, occupying my house, I lost a friend, and my house is, uh, has uh, been affected seriously now by the wall. I can understand how hard it is for you as a Palestinian negotiator, and your position must be very hard. But my question, are you able to negotiate without allowing your feelings and emotions to impact your judgment in taking decisions? You touched my heart. You, you know, it's... Look, everything I do doesn't paramount to one night some of my colleagues spent in Israeli jails. There are some classmates of mine who have been in jail for 26 years. There have been some classmates of mine who their parents took to the cemeteries. I negotiate in pain, in frustration, in tears sometimes, but I really believe that negotiating in pain and frustration for five years is cheaper than exchanging bullets for five minutes. We are a people of peace. We're bringing Palestine back to the map, and Palestine will harm no one. Palestine has stood historically as a bridge between civilization, between religion, and there is no meaning for a Palestine to come back on the map without it being democracy, human rights, you believe that accountability, will in your lifetime? transparency, the rule of law, and women's rights. You believe a free and that's Palestinian my promise state to you. You look like one of my daughters, all right? And that's my promise to you and to my grandchildren that Palestine will be a country of accountability, transparency, women's rights, human rights. Right. And I will believe this will happen in my lifetime. This will happen. Let's go to the back. Gentlemen, right at the back with the green shirt and the glasses on. Wait for the microphone to come to you. Uh, despite the challenges and obstacles faced, um, that somehow a two-state solution can come to fruition, um, are you confident that the ordinary Palestinian would agree and would accept such an agreement? Once an agreement is reached with Israel, sir, we're going to put this agreement, as President Mahmoud Abbas said, to a national public referendum for Palestinians anywhere they live and anywhere they can vote. And that's the truth. We're going to put this agreement to a national public referendum where all Palestinians can say, Yes or no? And who's going to vote in that referendum? Any, any country that would allow us. We are, we are, we're scattered in the five continents so, now. So all Palestinians will vote on a peace all deal? All Palestinians have the right to vote for this peace deal. And as I told you, me living in Jericho, or you living in Jerusalem, or somebody living in Gaza or in Scandinavia, makes you no difference. OK, let's try and get a couple more questions. Gentlemen here with the jacket on, let's wait for the microphone to come to you. Had a figure like Nelson Mandela been head of the PLO, do you think by now the occupation would have ended and Palestinians and Israelis might have reached peace? As I told you, if, if Mother Teresa were to be running Palestinians, and as long as the Israelis feel this sense of impunity, as long as your countries in the West and the Western values continue to treat Israel as a country above the laws of man, why, I don't know, but that's your values, I don't know. Look, Mother Teresa didn't run the Palestinian Authority. 
Nelson Mandela didn't run the Palestinian yes, Authority. Yasser, Yasser Arafat did. Yes, yes. He made a lot of mistakes. Something we haven't had time to talk about tonight. He made a lot of mistakes, did he not? Look, Yasser Arafat is the father of the Palestinian national movement. Yasser Arafat is the man who brought Palestinians back from refugees to a people with national rights. Yasser Arafat is the courageous leader who recognized the two-state solution. Yasser Arafat is the one who put us strongly on international law as the basis for a solution to the problem. Failure. Look, Yasser Arafat was killed because he stood fast for Jerusalem, for refugees, for our rights. And I tell you a joke to end. Please do. A Palestinian and Israelis go to a Western movie, Cowboy, and the star is running. So the Israelis, as usual, look at the Palestinian and tell him in 60 seconds, he will fall from the back of his horse, $20. And the Palestinian immediately provoked, yes, you're on. So in 59 seconds, the star fell from the horse. So the Palestinian carries the $20 when I give it to the Israeli, and the Israeli's conscience, feelings, guilty. No, no, I can't take it. Why? So the Israeli said, I don't want to cheat you. I've seen this movie before. So the Palestinian looks at him and said, I also saw it before, but I thought he would learn from his mistakes. And the minute we will learn from our mistakes, we are bringing Palestine back to the map, and that we will. Well, on, but just before we finish, on that very subject of mistakes, let me ask you one very final question. What is your biggest personal regret? Uh, there are many, many, many personal mistakes I made. I did not prepare Yasser Arafat for uh, uh, the Camp David. We prepared him for everything except that when they came and said, uh, Underneath Haram Sharif, there is a Timbal Mount. I decided to ignore this point. I didn't think they will bring it, and this turned out to be one of my biggest mistakes. This is one of them. I can, I'm going to have three volumes of mistakes one day published. And you do believe that in your lifetime there will be an independent Palestinian state? Absolutely. This is a fact. Palestine is coming back to the map. Well, on that note, we're going to leave it there. Uh, thank you very much, Saya Barakat, for joining us tonight. Next week, I'll be asking very similar questions uh, to one of Dr. Arakat's former Israeli negotiating partners, uh, the ex-Israeli Foreign Minister Shlomo Ben-Ami. So join us for Head to Head next week on Al Jazeera. Good night. <laughs>